we're going to be talking today about the console wars, and we brought on a special guest to talk about this. Yes. And his name is Joe, and he is one of the founders of the National Video Game Museum based in Dallas. Yes, it's well, it's just I think north uh, north of Dallas. Uh, Joe can give us better information about this, but. The National Video Game Museum is huge. It's an lo incredibly large building. If you've seen pictures of it, they have like full uh, history and like tons of consoles and how like things started off as just big clunky boxes with like wooden fake wooden paneling to uh -huh. what we have today. So let's get Joe on and let's get this talk going. Hey Joe, how are you? Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for being on the show today. We hope you've enjoyed some of the fun going on while you were waiting. Yes, it's wacky. It's super wacky. So what is your favorite console game from the past? Oh, my favorite console game from the past is Adventure for the Atari 2600. Oh, see, so he went way back. Wait, is that the one with the, the dragon that's not a duck? It's, it's definitely a duck. There's yeah, three yeah. ducks that chase your little square around, and you, you fight them off with a little arrow. Yes, I, I know that game. I never beat it. What was, uh, what's your favorite system? Uh, I'm going to say Sega Dreamcast. Sega Fanboy with me, yes! Not no, you. I, I love the no, Sega No, you Dreamcast. hate Sega. You're all making fun of me. No, no, I, I'm Wearing a Sonic me. the Hedgehog shirt, all about Sega. You better be a Sega Fanboy. That's right. Sega made amazing stuff, dude. Like, they were just... They were they ahead of their it. time, but they didn't have the right... I guess marketing behind them. They had made amazing stuff in Japan. They just never bothered to bring it to the United States. I look at you, Sakura Tyson. I wanted that dating for Sim Sand franchise. <laughs> You're like Damn it. five years old. What a dating Sims franchise? No. What's wrong with you? Wait, five? No, I was in like my twenties, dude. What are you talking about? And you still wanted a dating Sims in your twenties? Okay, we need to talk. Uh, no, <laughs> dating. It was a great game. All Look, right, Satan. so let's tell everyone a little bit about the National Video Game Museum up in Dallas. So we're actually in Frisco, which is a good 20 minutes north of Dallas. Okay. It's, uh, okay. It's, uh, we opened up in April. It is this country's very first dedicated video game museum. Uh, it's about 10,000 square feet. There's uh, 18 exhibits, each of which tell a story. Uh, essentially, we had a 50,000 square foot blueprint for a museum, and Frisco had 10,000 square feet for us to squish it into. So we sort of did a best of compilation on our first round here and put together these really cool stories. Um, you've talked about some of them already and as you were introducing this the, in the wood paneling, but we created these sort of backdrops, very cool moments in history where video games became relevant. The first time mom let us play a video game on the living room television set is our 1981 living room. Uh, we have a 1984 arcade, which you know guys like my age would remember playing. That's where you would go and play with your friends. It was before you got an internet you know, sort of uh, experience. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of different exhibits that tell specific stories about how online gaming has evolved over time, about all the crazy controllers and contraptions that we've used with game systems over the years, uh, stories about how the, the great crash of 1983 it affected the industry and how Mario came and saved us all. So, so on the video game crash is just part of your museum on fire with E.T. <laughs> in the middle of it laughing? Because uh, E.T. was part yeah, of it. Well, E.T. plays a prominent role. Oh, yeah. So, now, is it... Movie ET, or do you just put a bunch of blocks together to make an Atari ET? <laughs> no, but we do actually. The the crash era does show you a store and what a depressed game store would look like circa 1984. Wow, that ET is playing there. I ha I have to see that display actually. That would be one of those haunted houses for geeks and gamers to go into a yeah. store where nothing but ET is playing. It's got like people hanging on the walls and like wanting refunds and people on fire. Like that would be an amazing haunted house. <laughs> well, dude, my favorite part about that particular exhibit is that people will walk up to it and we have a bargain bin where all these games are piled in and they're all dollar each. And I will see customers walk up, guests to the museum, walk up, pull things out of that, build these giant stacks and then bring them over to the fake counter waiting for someone to show up that they could buy them from. How are you going to buy this game for a dollar or a Vectrex for 50? Um, you know, it, it's sometimes it's a little disheartening to tell these guys that it's part of an exhibit. And if they would just read the sign, they would have it figured out. <laughs> but so, reading is hard. We play video games. <laughs> well, then, you know, being part of the video game museum, you understand that there is, since Nintendo and Sega really hit the market and changed the way things were, there has been an ever going console war. Pretty much. And back then it made sense because the, the studios made the games for the consoles, not, hey, we're going to market to all the consoles. 
So you had games that were specifically on Genesis. That was the bulk of the games. You had the games that were on the Super Nintendo. That was the bulk of the games. So you had to make a choice. But then it started evolving where Activision says, okay, I want to put it on everything. Like example, Disney's Aladdin. Yeah. Which was on both. Most but it systems. was two completely different games. True. So, but there were a lot of similarities. They did a lot of the same levels. So, but I, I think. What about that kid that had a Turbo Graphics when everyone else had a? Yeah, that like Genesis one kid out there who was lucky enough to get one. <laughs> I always um, wanted one. The Neo Geo was always one of my favorite. Always wanted systems, but I didn't have three thousand dollars. Uh, I, I think. Good. I think to be fair, the console wars was one part marketing, one part kind of you versus your friends and 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 um at, at home, like. Oh, you have a Nintendo. You have that kitty game Mario. I have Sonic, and he's all fast. Yeah, well, Mario can set things on fire. So Sonic can just beat Mario any day of the week. That's why the Sonic versus Mario at the Olympics, you already know who's going to win. I don't know. Unless it's a plumbing Olympics, Mario ain't got nothing. But he's a better swimmer. Anyway, well, that's true. So, so you know, I, so at the beginning, the console wars made sense. But well, then it started to change, and you know when you talk about you had the Nintendo or the Sega, you had friends sitting on the couch with you back then, so you, it wasn't that big of a deal. But now everyone plays online, and when you have the same game on systems, but they can't really talk to each other, that's where I think the console wars are getting a little out of hand. I think the console wars, as it sits, doesn't really. If we compare it to Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and even PlayStation Two, the the console wars now is more. Up, I would say a part of the online culture where people are like, oh, you have a Nintendo, you must be obviously a Nintendo fanboy. Or you're, you have an Xbox, that means you're an Xbox fanboy. But if you, if you, most people at this point, they get a system because of the exclusives. They don't care about much else. People who buy Nintendo, they care about Mario, they care, care about... Nobody cares about those in these days. Well, it's the same game repackaged every <laughs> Well, true, but it sells like 35 to million To small cost. children because they don't know any better. Well, but what I'm saying is though, at this point, the console wars doesn't really exist unless you're talking about the exclusives, and then in most cases... It still exists, but I want to ask Joe what's your opinion on the console wars, how it started and where it's going. How, how do you feel about it? It's, I mean, you, you live and breathe video games, obviously. So yeah, you've I, got a huge you know, again, impact on I, I hate to go. Uh, I hate to go all old school on you again. Go right on ahead. You, we don't you're mind. using Nintendo and Sega as a jumping off point to console wars, but the guys that worked at Intellivision and ColecoVision would argue that they fought tooth and nail with Atari over the console wars of that second generation. And what's really cool about that particular war is that there were 11 players. You know, this is this is World yeah, War II you as know far that. as video games go. Yeah. There were 11 different Ataris out there, or basically quote-unquote Ataris. Yeah, yeah, there were there 11, the Odyssey, there were 11 the... U.S.-based consoles at all available at the same time when that crash happened. Wow. that That's not even anything. Ha um most of those companies didn't care about games so much that we ended up with some titles that were truly horrendous, like Custard's Revenge and Cree like Oregon Trail. No, no Oregon. You you know what I'm talking about, Joe, right? Like some yeah, of the well, games that came out there that basically the gaming developers had no um, scruples. Well, it was the Wild West, right? There were no real regulations on gaming. There was no seal of quality issued by any game company or any hardware developer. So anyone who wanted to make a game could make a game, and you didn't have an internet to go back to to sort of check out the reviews. You were stuck, and you had to make a lot of decisions. But like to your point, you're bringing up Chase the Chuckwagon and all those porny games that came out. There was a time when if you sent in 10 coupons from your Chuckwagon dog food, they sent you a game, Chase the Chuckwagon. Yep. So there was literally games coming out of every possible orifice of gaming. I mean, it, and you think about it like uh, Chex. Chex made a Doom, spent like $500,000 in 1990s to make a Doom version of a video game, first-person shooter about them eating, defeating evil, like, soggy monsters. Chex monsters? Yes. I mean, yeah. Chex. Wow. <laughs> I prefer to get wacky wall crawlers in my cereal. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, – the console wars as a whole, in my, in my opinion, was more about marketing because Nintendo's – strategy changed from let's make this about family and let's make this about kids they took the game gaming systems and they took them from like where they were in electronic stores like sears used to sell video game systems yeah and then they moved it off to like toys r us 
They catered it to be more of a toy. Well, see, when you talk about Nintendo, I I think what they did wrong is they're not developing new properties or franchises. They're stuck with Mario, Zelda, Pokemon now. No, no, no. You're talking about Nintendo now. Let's go back this to 1986. Is, but yeah, back then, they had a lot of fun games. Right. But then they kind of decided, hey, we want to just stick with our core franchises. So they haven't really been able to, to keep up. I think they have been able to keep up. I think it, but the problem is, is every stride they make, it just wait. Everyone else then gets up to them. As an example, uh, Splatoon. Splatoon is a lot of fun. But game. nobody you, owns a Wii U, so yeah, it's a really good game. But nobody really owns a Wii U, so that's a problem. True. So, so Nintendo's kind of out of the game, but they're wanting to come back with the NX. But Maybe. you, when you talk about people wanting what exclusive run. The exclusive these days have been, oh, you get something a month ahead of time. I mean, the, there haven't been a lot of, I mean, there have been console exclusives, but they haven't been as stellar because everyone wants to do Call of Duty or Black Ops or whatever it is. They all want to do the same type of game, and those are on everything, but it just depends who gets what first. So it's still there. I mean, when you go, it's always who won E3, who did this, who did that. I think the console wars are just kind of a moot point these days. I, I agree with you because... At the end of the day, nobody cares about what console they own. They only care about the game. Everyone like, like when I was when Nintendo when Pokemon first started coming out, there was the Neo Geo Pocket, there was the Sega Game Gear, there was a couple other handheld games. Why didn't why did everyone buy a Game Boy which had inferior graphics and a worse battery life? Well, let's ask Joe if he knows why. Why did everybody buy a Game Boy? Well, for starters, that battery made a big difference. You know, that was the first time you could really take a Game Boy on a long trip and not have to worry about replacing the batteries. Yeah. Can't help. But, but ultimately, I think like any other game system, it comes right down to the characters and, and the franchises. And they had all of that. You know, from the game Tetris that you got, that if that didn't lock you in, you had Mario games on there, Zelda, Kirby, mm -hmm. Metroid. It, it, like Pokemon Soul... Game Boys. That's exactly why I think Nintendo can't get out of the handhelds because they refuse to put Pokemon on next-gen systems. No, no, they, they have. No, no, Pokemon Snap and Coliseum do not count. You need a true next-gen Pokemon game, and I guarantee you Nintendo would win hands down. I, I You know what, Monster Hunter? We just need to bring up Monster Hunter. So, Joe, as you know, looking at how the console wars are today... How do you see that adapting as the future comes on? Because Microsoft wants to break down the you know, game between system walls and let people play on anything. And they have the Scorpio coming out, which is going to, I mean, they're, they're really starting to think about let's change the dynamics so that there isn't a console where you play what you want to play on what you want to play it on. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, listen, you guys, you, you know, you're fanboy TV. So I, you're the people that I would imagine take sides on things. Like oh, we that. do all the time. I'm straight up Xbox because I'm multiplayer. <laughs> My brother's PlayStation 4 because he plays by himself. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I pick a game based on the – I pick the game uh, system based on the game. No, he's a PC player. I play I, – I would own a PS4. I would own – I own an Xbox One. I will own a PS4. I will play it because I want to play the games. But see, it's like – like I said, they, they're they two different systems because I've noticed that a lot of people like to play solo games, go to the PlayStation 4 because there's a lot of that. And the people like me who are social gamers go to the Xbox because they're the king no, of that. Troll. We're not trolls. You're troll. <laughs> he, uh, he's just mad because we played Disney Infinity. We hit him with frying pans over and over again. All he did for 40 minutes. <laughs> we hit him with frying pans on stop. So as you're looking at the console wars and where they're going, you know, from I, I, I'm, I'm going to call you a video game historian because, you know, you had to research all this to even open this museum. Is this a good route to go, or should we always have like the dividing line? No, man. I think it's a great way to go. Um, it's going to uh, it's going to be polarizing for people because if you are, like I said, a fanboy of a particular system, and you're suddenly faced with that um, playing in the same pool as those other kids, it's going to be a whole different type of an experience. But for me personally, having grown up sort of being the anti-fanboy, I always appreciated something from every system, no matter how awful its library seemed to be. I, I was an Atari Jaguar fan. I was a Panasonic 3DO fan. If you could find some love in those things, you probably love just about everything. So I always looked for those opportunities where there was a cross-platform opportunity to play on my Dreamcast against PC guys. There was very short, brief periods of time where you could do that. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought those were the coolest things. So 
I kind of like what Microsoft is planning on doing here, and uh, I, I hope it happens. I, I'm not so sure that it will. It seems like it's going to happen, but... Um, well, gonna... he, he, you brought up an interesting point when he said there's always going to be those fanboys who want to do either or, and Microsoft just seems to be saying, okay, let's break down these walls, but what's stopping it is PlayStation seems to be wanting to go after like the, like they have exclusive content for Destiny for a year, so you can't really cross-play right there. Right. And they're, they're going after more of those exclusives where Microsoft's saying, you know what our exclusives are? The games we make. Because you'll come to play those games over here. Everything else that's on in every system, let's just let you play with everybody on PC and this. So I think PlayStation might be the one kind of holding this idea back because they I think they like the idea of the fanboy army. Even though they won't say it, I think that's what they like. Well, also, I mean, you can look at it this way. Competition breeds innovation. That if you kind of remove that wall, you also remove the wall of innovation. The reason that we went like the reason that Nintendo went from eight to sixteen was to become more competitive with Sega. The reason Sega went from cartridge to CD was to be more competitive with Nintendo. You keep getting these innovations fighting back and forth. But I think we're at like the, the I don't know how much further we can go graphics wise. They're already introducing VR. They're already going to be introducing augmented reality game with the Hololens. How much further can we possibly go in video game technology? Joe, do you have an opinion on this? Well, I, I kind of agree with his opinion about the innovation and that how you know they pushed each other because they're competitive to do the best thing, right? That console had to be better than the other one. Um, but I also think that by bringing all these pools together, now you're focusing more on your game being the best. So yeah. now you're competing with a much bigger pool of people and all of the gamers and way more people playing one single game on one single sort of platform. I think that kind of makes those developers think a little bit harder about making that game better as opposed to making something that pushes that particular system into some area that the others don't. And see, that's a good point because a couple shows ago we talked about the right the dangers of rising gamer expectations about gamer right. hype yeah. and how the studios are a lot responsible for things like DLC content. When you get half of a game and they have to pay for the other half makes no sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I get it. Like, Guard of Warfare is the best because all the DLC is free. You pay for the game once, everything is free. But I bought Battlefront and I have half of a game because they want to charge me 60 bucks for the other half. Mm -hmm. So we're to that point where we're allowing that to happen. So maybe he has a good point that, you know, breaking down those barriers will now focus on a much better, fully-fledged gaming experience. Maybe we won't get the Bethesda game full of bugs. Well, I, I love Bethesda bugs. Your horse can defy physics. I want that. Uh, but I don't, <laughs> the thing is, though, when you talk about games versus consoles, the systems themselves... It's almost two different beasts. Unless it's like Halo or Naughty Dogs, uh, not, some of the Naughty Dog games for Sony or Mario for, for Nintendo, yeah. the, those third-party companies, that's up to their QA. That's up yeah. to them. So the consoles really don't have a say in the matter. Hell, a Nintendo was the only one for a while, I still, still think does, has a quality control. Like all like their quality Mar control has limited them to releasing the same Mario game and the same Pokemon game over and over again. Don't even tell me that's a good thing. Well, ex except you know you do end up with uh, companies that at least they'll release a game that's solid, or not so buggy. Versus like my horse can defy. How physics. hard is it to just re-release a game that didn't have any bugs to begin with, but with the flashier graphics? Well, we can get some game developers in here to talk about that <laughs> later. <laughs> so. That's been our talk about console wars. Before we go, I want to talk to Joe a little bit more about the National Video Game Museum and how can people find more about this online? Online we are nvmusa.org. We're on Twitter, nvmusa. We're on Facebook, nvmusa. We're pretty easy to find. Uh, and since we're the only dedicated video game museum in the country, we should be really easy to find here in Frisco, Texas. So are you expecting a whole bunch of people to pop up with like little pop-up video game museum shops all over? Hey, there's actually a couple of those already sort of. Oh so. yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, the Smithsonian has its own wing for video games. There's the strong museum of play in Rochester that has a wing for video games. We had been a traveling museum for 17 years. We wow. waited, we waited for a permanent home. Like where, when is somebody going to make this a, a place, one single place? And, it had to be us, I, we, you know. So if there's others that pop up over the country over the course of the next few years, I hope I get to see that in my lifetime. I would love it. So when you describe when you described it having like the different builds, is it like walking through an IKEA store and just seeing all the little different displays? You can kind of go in and sit and like pretend to play games. I mean, that's a part of it, you know. There, like I said, there's those little snapshots in time that you're supposed to interact with and be a part of, and they're great photo ops. And real families from today can step back and be a family from the past. And it's kind of fun watching all of that happen. But 
there's just tons of games to play. You know, there, I counted the other day, we had 87 different game consoles or, or handhelds to play at at any given time. So um, there's a lot to do there, a lot to see. And I think we've told a lot of really good stories. So even if you want to go to the place and approach it as a genuine museum, like just like you would go to an art museum, you will definitely learn things about this industry. And I'm, I'm all about that. I love going behind the scenes in gaming and get to that, that meat, that real flesh of what gaming is about. Yeah, so, because I, uh, game stories and the way they developed, I mean, I, I remember playing the Atari way back then because it was simple. You play, go outside, but now we don't go outside because the games are like five weeks long to finish. Yeah, right. Game town this day get better. Get better best Fallout Four is a time suck. That you is walk true. from one town to another, you've lost four hours. I don't know how it happens. You just do. Call of Duty is four hours at best. We know. But I have a question for you, uh, uh, Joe. Was there a game system or a game itself that you guys got? You opened the box and you were like, "Wow, I can't believe we got our hands on X," or whatever it was. There is. There is. Uh, so having traveled all those years. Um, we never had every single game system released in the U.S. because we were missing one. That one is the RDI Halcyon. Have you heard of this? No. I'm going to be honest. Okay, describe it because I think I have. It is a Laserdisc-based system that was designed by the same guy that did the hardware for the video game Dragon's Lair. And I know what you're talking about. The concept was you were going to play with this giant Laserdisc player a couple of games that were going to be Laserdisc games. And it had voice recognition... Uh, it was actually pretty pretty high tech and, and ahead of its time. Um, the problem is that the price tag was so, so high that they never really got it out of the development world and into retailer stores. So the only ones that ever made it out are the few that salesmen were pitching to various independent game stores hoping to make some sort of a connection. Uh, it never happened. So something like 50 of these exist. And um, I mean, I've been collecting since I was 17 years old. And I've never encountered one. But we were at E3 at our traveling museum um, probably about five years ago now. And some gentleman came into our exhibit and he said, I was a salesman for RDI. I have one of these in my garage. Would you be interested? So we were You're at like, sign me up now. <laughs> Kachik, I don't care. We will, st we will rob it from you. Now that we know you yeah, have we, it, you're not safe. We abandoned our exhibit and, and went right to his house. So we, we have one of those on display and it's, uh, it's really cool. You know, we're excited. We... Right now, a lot of people in the back are planning the road trip to to come see the museum. So we'll yeah, we decided we need to come film a show with you guys up there. So you'll see yeah, the whole do. crew at some point in time show up and you know hopefully not break things and set things on fire. We can't promise. <laughs> we can't promise if we're going to the museum. So thank you, Joe, for being on the show. You were super fun to talk to, and you had a lot of great opinions about the console wars that I didn't even think about as we went into the show. But yeah, amazingly fun and. So, yes, you, if you're up towards the Dallas area in the Frisco, make sure you go to the National, I want to say Toy Museum, because here we have the Toy uh, the National Video Game Museum. So, the National I, we can't wait. We're going to be, I have to yeah. go. But next so, up. that's it. Thank you, Joe, once again for being on with us, and keep up the good work up there, and, you yes. know, I can't wait to see what happens when you start expanding and adding, like, more sections, because you have to do an entire room dedicated to Sega. Yeah, but we're looking the forward 1990s. to the expansion. Just Sega. We just need Sega. No, we need to start doing the 90s. <laughs> All right, so. You can talk about me, say that I'm mean, but I blow your head off when I'm a pretty young